welcome to Kate's Egg. Today I am in Ontario, Canada at Lennox Farms once again with Brian and Bill. So this is so exciting and we are standing in a forced rhubarb field which I actually filmed forced for forcing because we like a two-year-old or at the most a three-year-old plant for forcing in the buildings. They seem to produce the best. And this variety with the big seed stalks on it is uh, Victoria, which is an old English variety, which I talked about in the wintertime. And uh, it produces very green rhubarb. It's quite... <coughs> doesn't look that appealing in the field. It's pretty green. But in the, in the building, of course, with no sunlight, it's Red is red, as you probably saw in the YouTube video when we did the forest rhubarb. And it's a very strong, healthy plant, so it's got lots of energy stored in it, and it will produce a good crop indoors. That's really neat. Basically, if it's, still, if it's longer than up above my elbow, I'll pick it. But anything a little shorter, I'll leave it for next week. So we're picking, picking on the average every four to five days. It grows at least an inch a day. And do you have to replace the roots inside every year? We do. That's why we have. That's why we have this field here for just for rootstock. People drive by, say, "Oh, you never pick your rhubarb." Or we, we do pick some out. We use this rhubarb actually for the wine for pressing, but because uh, it makes a nice color. But, uh, but uh, we normally leave ten or fifteen acres here that we hardly even pick. And people go, "You never touch your rhubarb." I say, "What's well, rootstock for our forest rhubarb building?" Because we, when we force rhubarb, that two or three or four acres we take out every fall, it's gone. It's it's used its energy up and it's wasted when uh, by springtime, so we have to keep replenishing it. So, wow. So these are th these are three-year-old plants. Started, they started out as a root about the size of my fist, with one eye on them. So this is a true family operation. Yep, I'm the fifth generation, and and Dad's the fourth, and hopefully my kids will be the sixth. We, we yeah. don't know yet; they're a bit young yeah. yet, so. <laughs> That's so amazing. I should, I should have quit when I was a teenager. My dad was explaining to me about picking these rhubarb roots up. And <laughs> at that time, they uh, didn't have the machinery we have now. And they dug them with a plow and they picked them loose with a pickaxe when they partly froze to the ground. And I tried that the first winter. I said, oh my God, this is a horrible job. But, uh, <laughs> but we mechanized a little bit and got it working better. So it's, and we have offshore workers now we keep for that extra two weeks in the fall just to get the job done. So that's not too bad. I've been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> That's really awesome. I'm fourth generation on our Montana farm and my dad grew up with combines without cabs or air conditioning. So I feel <laughs> very lucky to have the luxury of both. Yeah, I know. it's amazing how far technology and yeah, everything's I've come. Been, I've spent lots of hours on a tractor digging rhubarb roots and doing other things in the freezing rain. <laughs> it's half snow, half rain. And so like, man, it's miserable out here. <laughs> <laughs> and how long have you been growing forest rhubarb for? Uh, four generations. The first, uh, member of our family that came from England they didn't they didn't grow rhubarb until my great grandfather started growing it so or my grandfather started growing it so, so, it was, uh, so we, they actually they actually started growing it in the early 1920s and they came in around 1883 so so a very long time yeah still so over 100 still, years still 100 years growing for us rhubarb so is rhubarb your biggest crop that you grow on your farm pretty well yep yeah. that's very cool yeah, we grow, so like I said, we have about 90 acres of rhubarb. Then we do English peas after rhubarb harvest is done. So we'll start them in a few weeks. We do about 50 acres of them, all hand-picked. And then the Brussels sprouts is about 15 acres to finish the year off in October, so. And I also videoed Brussels sprout harvest here, which was just so fun. Yep. <laughs> it's, a nice, it's a nice crop because it's, yeah. it's fairly quick. It's three, four weeks and you're done. And, and yeah. then you get to work in the shop for a month or so and then it's Christmas time. So it's kind of a nice finish for us, so. Yes, and could you explain the main differences between forced rhubarb and your traditional rhubarb grown in the field? Well, forced rhubarb is a plant that we've, I said, grew in the field for two or three summers and we don't harvest it because we want all the strength we can into the plant. Yes. And then we uh, physically dig the roots out with a, we use a potato digger now instead of the plow like my grandfather used, but, uh, we use the potato digger, lift them, lift them onto the wagon, haul them into the building, and plant them in beds, and then leave them dorm, leave them dormant, leave the building cold, leave the fans on, leave the doors open, and so they have a dormant period until Christmas time, and then we turn on one building, and then when that one's almost ready to harvest, we turn the next one. So we keep turning on one after the other until uh, late March, and the last building gets turned on, 
So we started harvesting the first building in February, mid-February, and finished the last building uh, 15th, 20th of May, and we're actually overlapping by a week. We're picking rhubarb out of the field by then. And, so. wow, and rhubarb, forced rhubarb has much smaller leaves, of Small, course. And smaller leaf and very red, very red color, and the stalks are only half the size of these because it's, you're, you're not actually growing it from the sunlight and the rain. You're, you're forcing what energy we've stored in the roots, so. When you put the roots indoors, do you have to water them at all? Uh, when we're ready to turn the heat on, we go a few days later after the thawed out, we, and we actually use a high pressure nozzle on the hose and wash all the top, wash the top of every root. So you put on a pair of high boots, a pair of uh, wet, a wet suit, because it's the mud and the water splashing all over you, and it's a cold job because it's only 10 degrees Celsius in there, or 50 Fahrenheit and they spend the whole day or day and a half washing the roots all down. And then we leave them until the rhubarb starts to grow about three weeks later. And once the rhubarb gets four inches high and there's little white hair roots coming on the plants and then they're ready to start taking moisture. So then we start watering once a week. Okay, this is so amazing. Um, I'd never known that you could grow fo forest rhubarb before. <laughs> well, it's an old technology that's been around since the 1700s. And there used to be quite a few growers at one time in Ontario here and actually west coast of the U.S. And But uh, there's going to be less and less. Are you the biggest producer of forest rhubarb in, in Ontario? In Ontario, we're the only yeah. producer left in Ontario. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So we're probably the largest in Canada. Yeah. I don't think one time there's, what, 70 growers in the 1940s? Yeah, maybe not quite that many, but quite a few. Why have uh, so many operations stopped? Um... Well, the oil crunch in the 70s and the price of uh, fuel went up and that's, that's, what, that's what knocked quite a few of them out. They just said, that's it, I'm fed up with this and I'm not paying the extra cost for fuel. And a lot of them got older, the next generation, like I'm fortunate, I got a son that wants to take over, but a lot of farmers, their next generation isn't taking over anymore. So when they're finished, that's it, the farm shuts down and it's sold and yes. there's nobody growing rhubarb anymore for partly for that reason too. Well, also you can get fresh fruits and vegetables from all over the world now, whereas in the 1930s and 40s, you might have had oranges at Christmas time and you had fresh rhubarb that was grown locally yeah. in the sheds, right? So. And everything else is out of storage, pears and apples and fresh rhubarb out of the buildings. And Definitely. Well, this has been so interesting. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you learned a little bit more about forest rhubarb and what it entails to grow it. So a huge thank you to you for, for showing me about your operation. Well, thanks for coming again. Yeah, thanks again for coming. For, you're very welcome. And if you'd like to learn more about Lenox Farms. Yeah, you can check our website out, lenoxfarm.ca, and we uh, have a lot of history on there and uh, about everything we grow, and we have an online store if you want to check that out as well. So. And you can also come and pick up some delicious rhubarb. That's right. <laughs> Make sure to like and subscribe. Bye. See ya. Bye. See ya.